everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Voice of Pancreatic Cancer podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Weinberg, and I'm also being joined today, co-hosting with us is uh, Dr. Susan Sai from the Medical College of Wisconsin. If you tune in often, you will recognize her, of course. She's been with us quite a, a few episodes, so super excited to have her back today. And as well, we have a new guest. We have Dr. Mandana Kamgar, and she is an assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin and also a pancreatic oncolo oncologist. So welcome, Dr. Kamgar. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And Dr. Sai, good to have you on as well. Thanks for having me back, Miranda. It's always a pleasure. And Dr. Sai, would you like to uh, jump right in to kind of give an overview of what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, I'd love to. So, you know, Dr. Kamgar and I were talking about um, some hot topics in pancreas cancer right now. And I think something that's been in the news a lot and people probably have a lot of questions about um, has been the use of different avenues of therapeutically targeting what's called KRAS. Um, and so we thought we'd do kind of an ABCs of KRAS and kind of break down what KRAS does, what it means, how it's important to pancreas cancer, and how recently new developments have been um, used to, to target this, uh, this particular gene. So with that, maybe I can start with uh, Dr. Kamgar asking you to maybe just explain when people talk about KRAS, what, what exactly is that? Absolutely. So I think uh, I have to get a bit of more uh, simple discussion about it. And I think the best is to ju just go back to normal, try to figure out what is normal pancreas and then what makes normal become cancer. And then through that, we can also know the role of KRAS. Mandana, so can I interrupt you for a second? Sorry. Okay. Miranda, are you seeing that? I think there's like a little bit of a... Like a blur? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that too. But now it's you look good. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It was just right when you first started to talk. So maybe we can just take it from the top again. Sure. I think it, something with the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. So uh, I will be discussing KRAS through uh, starting first with what is normal and then trying to realize how the normal becomes cancer and then through that understanding what KRAS has to do with turning normal into cancer. So pancreas, like many of other organs or as a gland in our body, it is composed of some building blocks, which are called cells. And each of these cells in our pancreas has a very unique and well-regulated function. And this function is basically regulated through their command center, which holds the code of conduct, uh, which has the do's and don'ts written, and that is the DNA. And basically the DNA has different chapters for different functions in the cell. One such chapter, what we call gene, is KRAS. KRAS is very important to dictate to the cell in a regulated way how long you can live, how much you can give birth to new cells, and what is the boundaries, how much you can travel out of the pancreas and where you should stay. So uh, it is important for this DNA to be very well preserved because each of the cells in the pancreas, they don't live forever, they're not immortal. After some time, they become old and they have to replace with new ones. And it's very important for the DNA or the copy of this code that is given to the next generation to be the exact same so that they get the exact same information. Cancer develops because of sometimes unknown reasons, misspellings in these chapters have, and we call them mutations. So these mutations then cause wrong information to go to the new cell, and many times they start to act out. And this is how many times normal cells become cancer. This misspelling in the chapter of growth or misspelling or mutation in KRAS gene is one of the most common reasons for starting or the first steps in developing cancer in pancreatic cancer. And it's actually present in more than 90 of 100, like 90% of our patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is the most common subtype of pancreas cancer. So it has a very uh, important role in starting the cancer. And many believe that also in making the cancer go on. Yeah, that's really helpful. I sometimes think about, um, you know, cancers, again, as kind of acquired, an acquired disease of accumulated mutations. And in a lot of times, uh, I remember in medical school, we used to talk about 
oncogenes, which really drive tumors, and tumor suppressors uh, genes, which um, prevent somewhat prevent tumors. Um, so KRAS, um, I think it's an oncogene. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of times I use this analogy with the medical students that like if you're driving a car and you step on the gas too fast, that's like an oncogene that you have like uncontrolled acceleration. And then um, if you have a tumor suppressor, um, usually that can help like blunt that that uh, acceleration, except if you have like your brakes are out. So if you, you lose your brakes, then if you lose your tumor suppressor abilities, then you still have the same effect of uncontrolled acceleration. So, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting kind of way to think about um, genes in general and how they, you know, promote uh, tumor, tumor genesis and, and initiation. So um, I yeah, think that's there's a, a, that's a helpful oh. analogy just to kind of put it in layman's terms. Yeah. So, and, and everyone always, you know, inherits usually two genes, one from your mom and one from your dad. And uh, so if you inherit an oncogene, well, there's very few oncogenes I think that you can actually inherit. That's something you have to usually acquire um, because, oh, wow. because of it, it, you know, because it's accelerated from the beginning, it's usually, there's very few oncogenes that you can actually inherit and, and it's compatible, I think with like, Mandana, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. That's correct. Whereas tumor suppressor genes are very common, uh, commonly inherited. So like most people are very familiar with the BRCA genes, the BRCA1 right. and BRCA2. Those are actually tumor suppressor genes. So you may inherit one faulty copy, but your other copy is still working. So your brakes maybe aren't so great, but they're not completely out. But once you lose that other copy, then, then I think you get that um, acceleration that I was talking about. Um, okay. so that's, that's super interesting. I think, I think that's why there's so much interest in KRAS because it's, uh, as Dr. Kamgar said, it's, um, you know, it's present as a mutation in over 90% of pancreas cancers. Um, so obviously it's a huge target. If we could like target this gene that, that is so essential to tumor genesis, it would, it would be great. And it seems like it's a pretty early event in pancreas cancer, right, Dr. Congar? Does that do you? I mean, yeah, is that something the, that occurs earlier or later in the in the process? It is among the at least in the most common, like the one that you know, not necessarily in the inherited uh, version of it, but at least in the one that does errors one after each other happen in the gene and then predisposes us uh, or uh, the patients to the cancer. The KRAS is among the very early on uh, mutations. And um, it's believed that uh, while, you know, the cancer inquire, acquires some more changes, which makes it a smarter to be able to go on, uh, this uh, KRAS remains there and carries on some functions that we will re review later that it will have still a, a significance for the ongoing behavior of the tumor and the aggressive behavior of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Miranda. And Dr. Sai, you said, I mean, even though this is a, a newer discovery, we're already seeing research on if this is something that can be targeted. Yeah, I, and I think maybe, um, uh, Dr. Kamir, can you kind of, I know, I mean, there's a long history of people trying to car target KRAS, but can you provide kind of a, a review of, of what we've, what's maybe been done in the past to target KRAS okay. and how that yeah, works? So I think the challenge has been, and the effort has not been non-existent. It has been a great effort and great scientists has put a lot of uh, work into this. And I think that's what's coming into fruition right now. Uh, but what happened is that there were a lot of effort to try to really inhibit the acceleration effect of the KRAS and the growth of the cells by just inhibiting its effect. Like as if the cell was just is pressing the pedal, trying to remove that pressure. And Targeting the KRAS by itself is a challenge because it wasn't an easy target for the drugs. So what happened is that the idea was that, okay, if we can target KRAS, um, we know what KRAS does many times. It has many messengers that it sends to the cells, which activates different things that we don't necessarily want them to do. And then what about not targeting it directly, but trying to inhibit these messengers from doing what they are doing in making the cells go on and become more cancerous and more aggressive. 
And that has been like what we call targeting the pathways downstream of Keras, meaning that basically targeting these messages and preventing them from sending the message down. The challenge is with that is that there's not just one messenger. You know, there is so many different messengers that it sends. And if you want to try to basically inhibit one of them or prevent them from going through, the others will continue and many functions will continue to go on. And they might even pick up the last function of that one by just working a bit harder. And then they tried to say, okay, so we tried to see which are the most important one and we tried to target all of them together. And many of these are very crucial for the normal cells to go on as well. So these, uh, in the patients, it became very toxic. So the great and I think exciting news is that now they have been developments in actually being able to target the KRAS directly, which is great because it's far above before sending these messengers. So if you can target it, you basically block all of these messengers down a bit. And I think that is the very exciting time for us it's um, one drug, or I would say two drugs right now are FDA approved for a certain subset of KRAS mutation, because there are many different misspellings that can happen in different areas of this gene, and they have different names of themselves. Um, the most common of them in pancreas is the area called KRAS G12, and then there are different mutations. The drugs that we have are G12C inhibitors. Unfortunately, this is very uncommon in pancreas cancer. It's like less than 1%. So now there is a significant number of different drugs coming. Some of them are, all KRASs are inhibited, but some of them are directed against certain types of KRASs. Many of them are still in the early phase of development, but hopefully as they come up in the, from the lab to the clinic, I think in the few um, following in this year and following years, we'll have much more to learn about uh, the utility of them in our patients. Yeah, and so I think that's like, it's really helpful to just maybe uh, recap that. I think like um, the body is like so amazing at having redundancy. So um, th there's always been, I remember people saying that, you know, KRAS in the past has thought to be as a, as a, you know, as a target undruggable. And one of the reasons is this protein, is it's either on or it's off. But it pre preferentially, once it's on, it actually kind of stays on. It's hard to turn it off. Um, and uh, the reason why is it has to bind to another kind of protein to kind of um, to, to have it become in the off uh, function. And the binding to that protein is so, so strong that there's nothing else that can really outcompete it. It's like so tightly bound that it really prefers to stay in the on position, I think. Um, and so, and so as Dr. Conrad was saying, we, you know, the easier thing is just to target everything downstream from KRAS and try and hit everything else, but it's so complicated to do that. So, so Mandani, you had, uh, Dr. Conrad, you had mentioned a little bit about the different kinds of KRAS. So, um, maybe if you could expand on that a little bit more, like, um, how would someone know what kind of KRAS mutation they have? Like if, if I had a tumor, how would I, how, how do people know what kind of KRAS mutation they have? Yeah. Is there a certain testing that they do for it? And like it, you said it happens pretty early on usually. Yeah, I think this is a great question. So there, are, the real way to do it is to be able to basically in a simple way, read through the chapters and see what misspelling has happened. In this case, is to basically do a profiling, what we call of the, of the DNA. And it's done right now by two different ways. One of them is that when we do biopsy the tumor, when we get the tissue, uh, when we have the cancer, we send that cancer to a lab or to uh, so that they do a better analysis of the DNA and then they go and focus on KRAS and then not only KRAS, they give us information about many mutations, but for the KRAS, they can let us know what exact type of KRAS mutation is there. And then um, the other way is that maybe not as strong, uh, it's helpful if you find it, it can be a bit tricky if you don't find it, is to just try to look at DNA in the blood and see if we can find DNA of cancer in the blood and then try to use that to see what, what form of cancer mutations are there, what type of KRAS is there. 
The difference is that with the biopsy, we have more cancer. It's a bit more precise. And the challenge is that we have to do it like, you know, it's an aggressive thing. So, and it's not necessarily an easy thing to do serially many times. So now a lot of times, if we can get the biopsy by just collecting your blood and doing the DNA, the good thing about it is that then we can also monitor it over time, see how the tumor is evolving, see how the load of the cancer is, how much is it shedding the DNA, how much it's getting smaller, larger. So I think that is a newer way of just looking at the DNA just by what we call liquid biopsy. And that you, that's relatively new, being able to find it through like a blood, like a simple blood draw? As opposed to looking for the um, the cancer, uh, it's earlier, and I mean, it's the challenge is that you're really trying to detect the DNA of cancer within so many normal DNA of other blood cells, meaning that the test that you use is to be a very strong test to find that small amount of DNA in between so much, so much of normal DNA. So it was a bit difficult to really have a test that is such a strong test that find that small and then to be able to really go in depth about what is happening in that DNA. And I think that was taking a while. The other thing is that different cancers are a bit different in terms of how much they shed DNA in the blood. And as opposed to some other cancer, for example, colon cancer or such, the amount of shedding of DNA from pancreas cancer in the blood is rather less. So many times in the very early stages, we might not be able to find it. It's not that it's probably the cancer is not there. It's just that it's very low amount of DNA that we don't find it. But as the cancer gets larger and it spreads, that's the time that we potentially can find the DNA in the blood and do this test. So, and then if it's done through biopsy, is that something that's um, standard, like that's always that looked for through biopsy, or is that something that is specifically requested? It is uh, right now. I think there are two things that are standard. One of them is the genetic test, meaning that trying to figure out if a patient's cancer happened in the context of an inherited mutation. The other is this, what we call genomic profiling, and that is just basically trying to send the tumor to be tested so that, you know, what is specific about this patient's tumor and can we focus on that and find treatments that are just beyond chemotherapy, you know, things that would be, or if chemotherapy is things that are directed a bit more on the strengths or vulnerabilities of the tumor. So this is a standard part. And then even many times, these times we do a baseline, and then sometimes over time, we might have to either repeat the biopsy to see what has happened, or just do multiple liquid biopsies just to see what's going on and why is the tumor behavior changing over time. Miranda, that's a great question. I just want to reiterate that for anyone who's listening. So the germline, as Dr. Kamgar said, germline testing for mutations um, is universally recommended for pain, any stage of pancreas cancer. And then for tumor specific testing, like the biopsy or surgical specimen, you know, I think that might be site dependent. And at, at our institution, we do it on everyone, um, but not every institution may take that slant. But, um, but you know, there's some advantages in, in doing tumor testing and either longitudinally, as Dr. Comgard mentioned, if there's, um, you know, you have initial biopsy and then maybe you get another biopsy later, if there's some change uh, in the CT scan or anything else, then it may be informative of a new genetic change that's occurred. So that's helpful to monitor it over time. Or as Dr. Palmer was saying too, now we don't necessarily even need to be so invasive as to do a biopsy that sometimes we can detect these with um, ctDNA and blood tests. And I know um, that's probably a, a great topic for a future, uh, future podcast is talking about uh, ctDNA in, in pancreas cancer. I think um, just to reiterate too, it's it's um, challenging sometimes to find ctDNA in early stage pancreas cancer. So among those folks who are you know operable, um, the it's there's just challenging sometimes to detect it uh, for the all the reasons that Dr. Kamgar alluded to. But in the metastatic That's setting, that it doesn't shed into exactly. the bloodstream. Okay. Yeah, it it's, doesn't shed very much. The overall tumor volume is smaller, you know, in, in comparison to everything else in the body. So the ratio of like actually finding a, 
a, a mutant uh, allele or a mutant uh, a mutation against a lot of normal normal d- DNA is a little bit more challenging. It may be more valuable in the metastatic setting at this time. Okay, great. That's awesome. And then for the KRAS, I mean, it's causing so much stir and buzz. Um, why specifically for pancreatic cancer um, is it exciting? So I think uh, it is probably exciting in many diseases. The reason that it's more so is how prevalent it is in pancreatic cancer. As we discussed, more than 90% of our patients have it. So if we can do something about it, that means a large population of our patients can benefit from it. And do you foresee that that it's going to be, there is going to be an option to... Um, to use this in the near future? I believe so. And again, it's yet to be determined. Oh, just let me go back to the what you asked about whether we do the DNA analysis. I think doing it so far, we were actually trying to find those people who don't have KRAS because those are the ones that sometimes they have different drivers of the tumor that we can actually already have drugs for them. So, so far we couldn't target KRAS. So it was like, okay, it's there, but so what, you know? Now, if we have target uh, targeting abilities, then it's important because we find something that potentially at least as of now, our patient might be able to go on clinical trials with these new drugs to see whether they can control their tumors. And hopefully in future, if these drugs are found to be beneficial, these might be options beyond chemotherapy. So I think that in that situation, even knowing presence of KRAS and knowing the type of the KRAS, it's going to be even more and more important in future. Well, Nana, I think that's a huge area now that we're starting to appreciate more that even when patients don't have a mutation in KRAS or they have what we call wild type KRAS, meaning it's normal, um, that they there still can be targeted agents. So like people shouldn't despair that they don't have a KRAS mutation. It's, you know, it's not a, actually necessarily a bad thing. So can you maybe elaborate on what other things, if someone knows that they have a KRAS wild type and this is the minority of patients, but if they have a KRAS wild type, what are their mutations, you know, maybe would they maybe talk to their provider about that might, that might have an, you know, associated agent? Absolutely. So I think one uh, practical aspect for our providers, probably um, looking at this podcast is sometimes if it's difficult to get a tumor, or if you want in a timely manner to figure out how much pressure you want to put at this day and age, but we don't have any KRAS targeted therapy to put on doing the biopsy an easy and maybe dirty way of doing it is doing blood tests. If you find the KRAS, you know the KRAS is not there. If you don't find the KRAS, you don't know if the patient has it or not, but this is the step to go differently to the biopsy. Because if your patient truly does not have the KRAS mutation, which is wild type, that is the percentage that means that the tumor was initiated from a different pathway, not the KRAS and the many other tumor suppressors. And these can be examples. For example, there is other uh, mutation that can happen in a, some in a gene called BRAF. That is one of the common ones, especially happening a bit in a later age. So we have examples of BRAF patients that are treated with BRAF directed or other, like as we said, downstream of KRAS and RAF inhibitors, like what you call MEK inhibitors. I personally have patients that have been on it for more than a year. You know, this is drugs, just pills. They take it. They're not on chemotherapy. They're rather well tolerated. So it's really a game-changing uh, finding for our patients. Others are many times what we call fusions, meaning that an oncogene or a gene that promotes cancer is connected to another regulator of genes that turns the genes on and off. So an on making the gene always on gets connected to something that promotes cancer. So a cancer promoting gene is on all the time. And in this situation, we have many times, like we call it for this gene fusion, including RET, including NTRAC, ROS, ALK, and whatnot, we have drugs with other cancer types, like there have been many of them are uh, approved for lung cancer. And these can be also used in our patients with pancreatic. We have examples of our patients like EGFR, RET, that again, they have been on just 
a simple drug, you know, they know for more than a year or so, and then the cancer has been under very good control, the good tolerance. So it is uh, very important, uh, again, for the subset that you don't see the Keras mutation to really try to dig deeper and realize, is there anything that you can treat them specifically with targeted therapy? Um, uh, maybe we could pivot a little bit and talk about uh, targeting RAS, KRAS. So you've talked about specific inhibitors of KRAS for very specific types of KRAS. Um, and maybe you could talk, a, do, do you have um, a little bit that you could share with us about the targeting specifically of the KRAS G12C? I think there was some data earlier on this year about not just in pancreas cancer, but in many different cancers using a care, that G12C inhibitor? Correct, yeah. So there are currently two drugs. One of them is called Sotoracib. The other one is called Adagrasib. They're very used in different tumor types, mostly lung, colorectal, and pancreatic. Uh, and then some other types of cancer. These are cancers that already we know that they have a KRAS G12C mutation. And G12C is much common in lung, so that's why, and also colorectal, that's why the number of people that with those cancers on this study was much more. But we had a handful or such of patients with pancreatic, which were on these drugs as well. It's fair to say that the same drug in different cancer types has a bit of different control of tumor. Like the same drugs when using lung cancer, it can do better control of the tumor for longer time. Not that there is no effect in pancreatic, but it seems that pancreatic tumors are rather smart in finding ways to just find resistance or find ways to just let go of the control of this drug. And I think already the next phase is starting, even in all those tumors that they have had good control and pancreas, to see if we combine this keras 12 c with something different, can we make the, can we oversmart the tumor and control the tumor for even longer duration of time? Yeah, so it seems like it was a promising signal, but definitely not um, some, you know, not necessarily a, an end all uh, by targeting it. And there's a, a lot of other work that needs to be done. Um, maybe you could also tell us, you know, it, this blew up in the New England Journal. I know on Twitter there was a lot of action about um, targeting KRAS immunologically. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what was reported in the New England Journal? Absolutely. So that is what we call, in a way, a different type. We talked about, I mean, many of our uh, viewers know about chemotherapy. We talked about targeted therapy. And this is a different way of treating cancer going to immunotherapy. What it means is that we are trying to awaken the immune system in some way to just realize that cancer is abnormal and it's a parasite in the body and try to react to it and reject it in some ways. So there have been multiple approaches so far in many other cancers um, like lung, melanoma, an approach, many approaches are like cancer cells many times learn to put a face mask to basically protect them from being seen by the immune system as an ugly abnormal cell. And many of these immunotherapy that they were used, they basically remove that mask and they expose the immune system to them. Those I are like that analogy. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> great analogy. Yeah, so those are called checkpoint inhibitors. The other approach, which was a bit more in blood cells, is that they were actually T cells are a subset of immune cells that are very important in also preventing cancer from growing, developing. So what they were using, they were engineering to see the T cells in a way that they are much more stronger, basically in a way that they see through the mask and they see what is happening on the surface of the cell and then trying to get rid of that. Easier in blood cells because Many times there are great targets on the surface of the cell. They're already in blood. There are blood cells targeting blood cells. So it's much, much more easier in, in those. These approaches both are used in pancreatic, but they were rather disappointing. So the promise of this study in New England Journal was that they are using a newer engineering way for T cells and that it worked at least in one patient. So I think that's what very, uh, very, very interesting. And Dr. Comrade, can I just interrupt you for a second? So when you said they used this, this method before, this kind of adoptive T cell transfer um, where you basically rev up the immune system and it didn't work, they were targeting 
uh, just like surface proteins that were on on the surface of how is this different than um, you know what what's reported in the New England Journal? So I am going to be a bit more technical here. So um, the other T cell engineering, the it's very new, but for us maybe the older version, it's what we call CAR T cell therapy, the carmeric antigens that basically they try to engineer the T cells in a way that they have something on their surface, they find something on the surface of a tumor, they connect, and then they try to get rid of those cells. Challenge is that they tried it in pancreatic cancer with different targets on the cells. So far, there are still ongoing trials. The CAR T didn't pan out as effective. Then the same team that has this study and others, they have been trying to see, okay, if you can't do CAR T, what if if we look in, like, take the tumor out, take the T cells out of the tumor, and then take the tumor out and expose the T cells to the tumor and then see which T cells are reacting to which antigen or which new antigen, like a new thing that is different in the tumor and not existent in the normal cells, and then see if we can then take this T cell out, engineer it so we have so many T cells like that and then make them stronger and put them in a batch and give it back to the patient and see whether now with a stronger army of T cells that we saw that they were already out of the body reacting to the tumor, maybe we can then make a response to the tumor. And actually in 2016, I think the same team as well had a New England publication about a patient with colorectal cancer that they used this and they saw a response. Challenge was that they were treated, at least even in that report, 12 or more other patients with GI cancers that they didn't respond to the same uh, treatment. So meaning that amazing technology, but it wasn't, and it probably isn't still completely well understood why some people do respond, why some people do not respond. This approach that they use in this one, which basically they use the same type of T cell that they got from that colorectal patient, because they are different type of T cell. Each T cell is very unique to our body, and it's what makes our body immune system unique. They have uh, ways of figuring out, they call HLA. So there are different HLAs on the T cells that define your HLA might be different than mine. Mine might be different than my family members. So it's very unique. That's very important. Like that's if you see that compatible T cell or not. So T cells have to be compatible to put it back in your body because otherwise your body would reject it. Yeah, Mandana, I think for the people who are listening, maybe the easiest way to understand that this is actually an extrapolation to transplant. Like yes. when people get transplanted, you can't just get a transplanted heart or liver or kidney from anyone. You have to be what's called HLA matched so that Correct. your blood types are matched and among right. other things. So that's that's maybe a, a more common way to think about HLA. Absolutely. So I think but that's with, easy. Sorry, sorry, just a quick question. But with this, it's yeah, you're using the patient's own T cells. Correct. Yes. So that's why it's compatible because in the T cell infiltrating, you get the same patient's tumor, you have this a bit engineering and put it back. In this one also, they use patient T cells, but they try to engineer them in a way that they 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 had the same HLA as the other colorectal patient and they had the same KRAS mutation, KRAS G12D as the other patient. But they tried to engineer them to act as the T cells of that other patient, meaning that they put a virus that presented something that presented a, 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 significant, a different T cell receptor connected to an antigen that would make this T cell act like the T cell of that patient with colorectal cancer. It's, it's still there are T cells of the same patient, but they enge engineered them differently. And then they put them in the body. The uniqueness of this approach, like T cells engineered in this way, is that they can find target inside the cell, meaning that they just don't look at the surface of the cell. They can find molecules like KRAS, which are hidden inside the cell. So they can go find that and then they start to react to them. That's the good part. The bad part is that these are very unique. As we said, it has to be a compatible HLA. It has to be a certain type of KRAS. So if you look at what they did with the New England, it's like 40% of patients have KRAS with OD, maybe 10% of patients might have that HLA. So together, less than 4% of patients might have an opportunity to get it. And even that, they did nearly the same thing on two different patients with the same HLA, same KRAS. One of them responded, the other one didn't respond. Mm 
Meaning that the, it's amazing that the technology is now available, but it's much more to be learned to realize who does respond, who doesn't. And great news is that many other teams are working on expanding this access to this molecule, more HLAs, more care assets, and then different ways of engineering them. So I think this will be hopefully one other area that will be a lot of uh, developments for newer ways of immunotherapy in pancreas cancer. So in other words, seeing a lot of promise, but definitely not there yet as far as being able to implement any... Right. I want to go back to one other immunotherapy possibility, and that is targeting Keras if we have the targeted therapy. Keras is, we know that it's important in making the immune system not recognize the tumor. So if you use a Keras inhibitor, and that was also alluded to in one of the presentations in in our um, meetings that if you can use Keras inhibitor and inhibit the Keras, while the response might not be durable by itself, but you have a window that the immune system is stronger now, that it can maybe fight against the tumor better. So this is a window that you might be able to use even our already available um, immunotherapies combining with this and see whether now you can awaken the immune system and this way get a hopefully much more durable response. So I think that will probably be another area that hopefully we will see growth of immunotherapy combination of targeted therapy against Keras and different types of immunotherapy. Yeah, that's been, that's a great, I mean, I think the potential for combinational therapies, whether it be immunotherapy or other targeted agents, um, you know, I think is really exciting. I think for a long time, people thought like the field of KRAS was dead (laughs) um, because they they studied it quite extensively, but there was like a a KRAS initiative by the NIH that was started several years ago. And and we're really kind of seeing the fruits of all that labor from all those um, scientists. So it's really, it's really kind of a very exciting time to be a RAS biologist and, and kind of translating this um, into the clinics. Um, we, I think we are maybe coming to the close. I wonder if you have any final thoughts about things that we haven't talked about with regards to RAS. Um, anything else you'd like to share? No, I think we already covered a lot. So, but I hope um, in our next time that we have a podcast, we'll be already talking about our great experiences using these in our patients. And hopefully we will be getting closer to finding the better solution, the cure to this cancer. And I guess um, just a final question to kind of uh, bring it to, you know, maybe a patient that isn't sure and wants to, you know, make sure that they've been tested for this and, and that they are taking advantage of if there is any opportunity for them, uh, what would you two ladies recommend as far as talking to, to their uh, medical team? Yeah, I think probably the best is that uh, discussing it with your like you know, your oncologist. As we discuss, many times we do the test for the, um, for the KRAS subtype, then not all the time we do the HLA typing. I think we use a different vendor or a different company that we go to to do our testing. And as a part of that, they also give us the HLA typing of the patients. But in reality, if one of our patients wants to go on these studies, there are ways to collect the blood, send it to, like they do it all the time for organ donation. So it, it can be sent to uh, to the certain uh, like uh, companies that do this, and then you will be able to also do what we call a deep HLA typing, that they really look deeper into the HLA and they can give you a detailed information about that. But I think it's best to be done in a context of knowing that that result will lead you to something. So if there is a study available, I think that would be a good time to really do that to see whether you qualify for that. In the absence of an available study, I think that will be a bit more of a you know, not as much help. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, um, in Marina, we had a previous podcast about germline testing. So again, everybody yeah. should have germline testing. I think that's um, not controversial at all. And, uh, you know, here we think everyone should get somatic testing and it's usually done commercially. And so the, the thing for maybe everyone to have a conversation with their physician about is, you know, uh, different vendors who do the testing in the, in general, 
I don't think there's a lot of difference between a lot of different vendors. So they don't have to really worry about, will the KRAS testing be right or wrong, depending on the vendor? Mostly it's a question of whether it's covered by insurance. And mm-hmm. for the majority of our patients, um, we haven't really found an issue um, having uh, the at least the initial testing of any tumor covered. Um, that I don't know, Dr. Palmer, if you, you have had any obstacles, but pers- personally for us, post-surgery, uh, we really, it's very, very rare that we have any issues having it covered by insurance. Um, so I, I think at, at the very minimum, uh, uh, an initial biopsy should be profiled. Okay. But then, like you said, Dr. Kumbar, it, it might not even be something that's valuable to them to know um, if it doesn't necessarily lead to like a study or something that's available to them. I think it's actually, I think it's pretty, um, I think like, so if you had a wild type KRAS, obviously there's therapeutic implications um, potentially downstream. And those are probably um, actually in the tumor testing that they do, they don't just look at KRAS, they look at everything else. So if you have a wild type tumor, you may find the BRAF mutation or something downstream. So that, that has important implications. And then again, the KRAS testing itself, you know, right now the, the window of, um, Agents is very, <clears throat> excuse me, very small, um, but I think there's a huge pipeline of um, additional targets coming down the line. So, I, I think it's still valuable to know. The somatic testing, the genomic profile, mm-hmm. I think absolutely valuable in everybody. HLA typing was the fund that I was saying that it's probably better done in a setting that we have more treatments, but I think as the time goes, I wouldn't be surprised that the same company that does the evaluation of the patient tumor, they normally have enough normal or whatnot to just also evaluate the HLA piping as well. So hopefully that will become a standard part of the same thing so that hopefully we don't have to do separate things. Uh, But again, if needed, there are already available tests that, that HLA testing can be done. Yeah, so Miranda, the, the HLA typing probably is for a subset of people who might be, you know, there might be some kind of CAR T cell therapy or immunotherapy, um, as, as Dr. Kamgar said. But um, so that's maybe not as important, but maybe reported. But I, I, you know, I don't I don't want anyone to think that they their tumor should not be profiled. I, I think mm-hmm. almost universally we would say your tumor should be profiled. Okay. And Absolutely. and and usually, uh, I mean, what you from what you've seen, it's, it's never been an issue uh, with people's insurance and and things like that. It's just something they might need to request and, if and their so oncologist it, hasn't already. Yeah, yeah. And and almost with all of the the different commercial vendors, there is a process of kind of financial transparency in terms of the billing. So most of the vendors have like a very short questionnaire. It can even be done online. Um, that patients can, you know, even self, um, you know, self fill, and then it'll tell them, you know, we anticipate your cost will be completely covered, or at most the cost is usually about, I think two hundred dollars is is what I what I've been hearing. So mm-hmm. um, there, there may be costs, but they're not exorbitant um, in general compared to all the other costs <laughs> that are yeah. associated. Yeah, right. Okay, and then and then the value of having that information. Um, and, and what it can be used for. It's outweighs any of that. So awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you ladies so much, um, for, for all of this. I mean, uh, Dr. Sai, do you think we, we missed anything, any questions, final questions that you had? No, I just think, uh, you know, looking back, I think it's going to be great. Maybe if we could get Dr. Kamgar back on to talk about, um, you know, cell-free DNA and blood tests um, and, you know, biomarkers and pancreas cancer. Because I think yeah. as a companion to all of this precision medicine, I think we're seeing a lot, not only in targeting therapies, uh, targeted therapies, but also in biomarker development, companion diagnostics, and um, being able to monitor, um, you know, different different specific components of disease. So uh, I think we could probably expand on that in another uh, podcast. I think that's a great idea. That was something that brought a lot of uh, excitement at our event. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the patients really uh, expressed interest in wanting to know more about that. So um, yeah, Dr. Kamgar, if you're willing to, to come back and talk about that, we would love to have you. 
Absolutely. And again, thanks again for having me now. And I'm glad that you were here and that the site could be helped with the process. <laughs> this was my first time. <laughs> no, yeah, we really ex- appreciate your expertise. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, you ladies have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> Thank you.